Hey there, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Classic Gaming Brothers. I'm Seth. And I'm Zach. And we are the Classic Gaming Brothers. That's right. We are the Classic Gaming Brothers. We are the we Classic are Gaming the Brothers. Classic Gaming Brothers. Oh, a Classic Gaming Acapella group. Classic Gaming Melody. Oh, a Classic Gaming Melody. I, I don't think anyone has ever listened to our podcast and thought that we needed to sing. No, well, you know, I know you enjoy singing when in the morning and yes, I, I, I sometimes enjoy singing in the morning much to my partner's chagrin uh maybe we could do a classic gaming musical Ooh, for the morning times for the morning times we'll only do it in the morning because i don't sing past past noon right and people would only be able to play it in the morning that's and right we'll actually right. delist it every day after noon well anyway uh zach what have you been up to what have you been playing lately Seth, recently I've been playing a little game called Rogue, or by its full title, Rogue, Exploring the Dungeons of Doom. We have a listener who really enjoys roguelike games. Yeah, well, this is where roguelike gets the the name Rogue. So when something is called a roguelike, it is like this game. So Rogue was originally released in 1980 and was created by a company called AI Design and published by Epix for a variety of systems. So it was available on the Amiga, the Amstrad CPC, the Atari ST, the Commodore 64, CPM machines, the TRS-80 color computer, the ZX Spectrum, or ZX for our European friends, and MS-DOS, which I've been playing through a recent release on Steam, which was one of my by weight passes. And this is the MS DOS port. It actually runs directly through DOSBox. So when you buy the game from Steam, you get an executable and it just does its magic in the back end and just loads DOSBox up and there you go. You're in Rogue. Though it has been optimized to run, it seems fairly well. I know sometimes DOSBox games, even though you're running them through DOSBox, don't run very well. Uh, yeah, you have to play with the rates. If you're So many games that you purchase through a retailer, such as good old games or Steam, that have DOSBox, that need to use DOSBox, tend to already be optimized for play. You can, though, run games through DOSBox without buying them through a retailer in the event that you have them. Like if you have an old copy of a a game when you purchased it originally back in the 90s or what have you. So you can use DOSBox to run those old copies through mounting the images and stuff like that. But there's like like a refresh rate or something that you have to play with. Yeah, and like uh, different CPU structures and stuff like that from the time. I mean, games like Rogue, when they came out, they weren't necessarily designed for high-end gaming computers. They were designed to just kind of run through any normal computer that you could probably have. So having something that has a faster processing speed than the computer that it was designed for might lead for some awkward things to happen in the game. But uh, this version has been optimized to run very well, and it does run very well. So Rogue, for those who don't know, is a procedurally generated dungeon crawler that uses ASCII graphics. So it's all text-based graphics. And the game is pretty unique. It has permadeath. So if you die and restart the game, you'll have an entirely new game game um so you won't have even the same dungeon that you're playing in or any of the stats that you had and that's what gives us the term roguelike so games that are called roguelikes are like rogue they are um, usually procedurally generated dungeon crawlers that have permadeath um, sometimes they're not procedurally generated. I know the Dark Souls games have been referred to as roguelikes, but they are not procedurally generated. But games like um, Rogue Legacy is, a, I think, a perfect example of a roguelike title where it's a procedurally generated dungeon that has permadeath so that your character will have to restart from scratch as a whole new character in a whole new dungeon. It's a it's fun that it uses the ASCII graphics because it's ties kind of into what we will be talking about later it's, on in this episode it's, it's, on, it's on theme it is on theme so recently i know you didn't ask but no well, i was going to but go seth, ahead you can ask seth what have you recently been playing recently i have been playing a game called suzeran suzeran 
Suzerain. Uh, it was uh, developed by Torpor Games and was released December 4th of last year, 2020. In the game, you play as a, a new leader of a region of the world that is, the region of the world is very similar to the end of the Soviet Union Okay, so like region of the world. 1990s Europe. So politically, it's like the end of Soviet Union. Okay. Or towards the end. Okay. It's kind of like Gorbachev, soon Soviet Union. Okay. Where there's been a previous communist regime and there, well, there was, a, it started with a communist regime and then it came into a regime that was more like open to free markets and stuff like that. So uh, it kind of has these two balancing things. A really cool part of the game is the beginning of the game where you get to kind of decide how your character rose to power and whether it was through being a good person and just being the right political option Mm -hmm. or other ways that you can rise to power politically. And you have different regions in the area, some regions that are similar to um, like other communist superpowers and other regions that are more capitalistic and have more democracy, very similar to like where the Soviet Union was with China on one side and the Americas and Europe on the other side. It plays 100% on the map of your desk. So the entire game board is like a 3d representation of a map that's on your desk like you can see a radio and you can see like there's like tags in each of the areas of the country that will drive you with uh reports and there's also issues that will arise that you have to solve and it's very in-depth like the world is it's so much that they do include a in-game notepad so you can take notes about what's going on and there's an executive branch a legislative branch a a judicial branch and there's different like parties that are involved and you want to make sure you have all the parties that you want to work with and you have a you know majority so that you can get policy done and you have to decide on policy and policy takes a while to do something and it's just like the real world and as you go through the game you can decide whether you want to adopt a more free market democratic approach or if you want to go to the state running everything in a more of a planned economy on top of that you can also determine how corrupt you are and determining if you take bribes for things or if you don't take bribes for things or if you call people out when they try to bribe you and you could do it with either form of government right it doesn't just because you're free market and democratic doesn't mean you're not corrupt and same with being on a planned economy just because you're a communist doesn't mean that you're not corrupt or corrupt to begin with so i think it's very interesting there's uh definitely various like situations will come up and you have to decide do you want to send stimulus checks to all of your people or would you rather stimulate your economy do you want to build a high-speed rail between your your biggest port and your capital city or do you want to reinvest the in do you, or you want to bring up the infrastructure in the poorest part of your country and do you want like do you want to support the business which will possibly ultimately drive the economy or do you want to support your citizens and make sure that your citizens are taken care of all while making sure that you are doing different diplomatic efforts to to other countries to make sure you have the right allies in the place and that you're fending off any wars and stuff like that. So there's a lot going on and it's really cool. This first time that I'm going through, I'm playing as more of a democratic reformist. So like I want to reform everything and I'm trying to essentially take my party and because there's a lot of reformers as well. So I want to take like, I want to combine, I want to do enough things so that the majority of the party stays with me and that the reformers also adopt me. But I, I don't want to stay in power forever i'd rather just serve my term and then be done but so yeah so that's suzerain suzerain nice i'm sure i'm saying it wrong but i think that's uh what we do best on the show is we say things wrong that's right that's like like menzo baranzen menzo baranzen there you go i said it (laughs) it only took me a few episodes today we are talking about a game that is uh an interesting game it's probably a niche game, I would say, considering I think if I asked a room full of people if they've heard of this game, probably wouldn't get a lot of responses back, depending on their age, but most likely they will, even if they're of the right age. <laughs> um, but this game is a little game called ZZT, or ZZT, if you are in a country that doesn't say Z the way we do, but we're going to say ZZT. <laughs> We're going to say ZZT because that's just the way that we, uh, I always want to say ZZ Tops. (laughs) ZZ Tops. We're talking about ZZ Top today. (laughs) 
<laughs> Classic Gaming Brothers taking a trip to Music Land for ZZ Top. I really enjoy ZZT. I think it's a fun a system, I guess. It's hard to just to say it's a game. Yeah, it, it really defies being like it is a game and it's not a game. Like it's a. Yes. Yeah. It is simultaneously a platform and a game yeah. all in one. Yeah. And uh, I'll go first with my memories, unless you want to go first with your memories. I mean, my memories are pretty short. Sure. Why don't you go? I, so so alluding to what Seth said, and I think he's going to talk about more of it in his memories, and we're going to talk about more of it overall, is that ZZT is both a game and kind of a platform. So there were some custom worlds that you could build for ZZT, kind of like custom games. And I remember watching Seth play ZZT. I remember him going onto the world of ZZT, which was a website dedicated to finding different ZZT custom games. Um, I do remember some Sonic themed ones, probably because I was very little and asked Seth, show me sonic <laughs> or show me death i don't remember the exact sonic themed ones but there is a sonic zzt blast that is from around the year 2000 i think that might be one i remember and uh i also think i remember the game being way more graphically impressive than it really is um, in the sense that i think my imagination really really was playing with what the game was providing on the screen and i probably imagined the game being more powerful than it is as a game <laughs> than, right you know. yeah so i I, I mean, I, I, I feel similarly when it comes to uh, my memories of ZZT. Uh, so they stem back to the late 90s for me, where I spent some time being homeschooled for about a year or so. I remember that. And during that time, we would go to homeschooling groups so that we could meet other children who were homeschooled. Since when you are homeschooled, you do not go to a school, just like how everyone's getting homeschooled now. Which fitting is being 2020, 2021 kind of reference on there. Topic. If you're listening to this in the future, isn't it on topic? You don't meet a lot of children in your home, so <laughs> at least you, you, don't you meet, meet at least of, two, and those are your brothers and sisters. Yes, you don't you don't meet a lot of strange children. Well, be that as it may, I my mother would bring me to homeschooling groups to meet other children mm. and who did not live with me, and so that I could make friends. And do like group events, like field trips. Uh, I remember we took a field trip to McDonald's, which was fascinating for me as a child. Uh, anyway, through the pro through the the program, we we met a, a family that we uh, ended up doing a lot of different activities with, and I, I I made friends with one of the the kids in the family, and I would go over and we would play video games, and he was one of the few people uh, in that time that had. Uh, a PC that played video games. Uh, not only did he have a PC that played video games, uh, generally he had a PC where it was in the basement. So it was kind of unregulated in regards to parents seeing what you're doing on it. So we played games like ZZT, uh, Neopets, and a game, I remember a game called Creatures, all on a Windows 3.1 mm. version of the computer. So we played a lot of ZZT and like hours and hours of this game. And when I finally got access to a, my home computer, I also, I went and got ZZT on my home computer. Mm -hmm. I think I might have gotten a copy of of the game from him on e probably either a CD or uh, a floppy. I think disc. we had it on a three and a half inch disc. Yeah, and I think I got it from him. Yeah, and I really think that my favorite part of ZZT was the the modularity and the fan created games or what are called worlds mm. in ZZT. And I I love that there were people out there that were dedicated to making these fan crafted games. Yeah. That really were had an in-depth story. Like there was a lot of games that had really good story. They had interesting takes on the game mechanics. There was a few games where they like replicated Tetris and Donkey Kong through mm. the ZZT engine. Right, yeah. Which is impressive. And the simplistic graphics, because it will get we'll get into this, but ZZT uses ASCII graphics, I thought led to almost an expansion of creativity while observing the game uh -huh. and playing through the games. Because you had to being forced by the graphics to supplement your own creativity for the game. Yeah. So it was like almost reading like an interactive book. 
mm. to the point where you're like seeing it. I mean, you, it is right because it's all text and it's just like w- weird text yeah, yeah. that is arranged into images. But <laughs> it's like you're essentially interpreting these images in your mind's eye and creating these game experiences. And I think that's that's just something that I think that's lost on video games as well as we've pushed forward this like needle on uh, graphics, making them ultra realistic. Our brains don't need to make up that gap, right? Our brain doesn't need to make up that. Uh-huh. What would this look like, or what would this person look like? Which you do when you're play, like reading a book, uh-huh. um, where older games with older style graphics, you kind of do have to kind of refine those edges or add in some layer of creativity. Which is one of the reasons why I still really like older video games because I think that it still helps my creativity mm. as it, as I'm playing them. So to get into the history of ZZT, we really got it. We also got to kind of break break into history of a couple other things starting off for those who don't know um which might be a large number of you zzt is an action adventure puzzle game as, as best as you can describe it that was developed by potomac computer systems potomac was founded by and pretty much solely run by a man named tim sweeney sweeney at the time was attending the university of maryland and he was actually hence the name potomac yes hence the name potomac because the university of maryland is located on the potomac which is a river and also he lived nearby so he grew up around the potomac river he developed zzt originally as a text editor to be run in pascal now for those who don't know, Pascal is a fairly older programming language that became popular in the 70s with the dawn of the mini computer, which is kind of a misnomer for anyone who has ever seen a mini computer because they are very big. <laughs> mini computers are about the size of what we might think of as a refrigerator or or a cabinet. The reason they're called mini computers is because they are smaller than the computers that came out before them. So it's where it's like 2000 square feet. Yeah. So as opposed to having an entire room that's a computer, you have a closet that's a computer (laughs) so that is mini though pascal really became popular once compilers for microcomputers hit the market such as the early microcomputers that used micro microprocessors such as the um, mitz altair 8800 the imsi both of which were sold as kits and were much smaller they were about the size of a vcr so that probably is a little more of an appropriate term microcomputer versus the mini computer anyway zzt while intended to to be just a text editor akin to something like what we know as notepad spawned into a game when tim sweeney began experimenting with ascii characters ascii is the american standard code for information exchange and is a form of character encoding that has been popular with computers since the 1970s and while fairly simple programming a game in ascii actually allows the game to be small because ascii text was not very size intensive and doesn't use any graphics besides the ascii characters available so for for example, if you think of a game like Sonic or Mario or Zelda, these games use sprite-based graphics. So these are actual images that have been transcoded in a way to be interpreted by the code. So you have a visible image on the screen using a variety of colors. ASCII is literally just text and it's a whole variety of text images. So ASCII isn't just like alphanumeric, it's symbols as well. So for example, in ZZT, your character is represented by a little smiley face and collectible items might be, for example, the degrees symbol, which is that little circle that goes next to numbers when it's a degrees. Or it could be, for example, a a spade symbol, like from a card set or a dollar symbol or a pound symbol or a yen symbol. So any symbol that you can really think think of that you could use via something like Unicode or or something like that in a modern text uh, interpreter is probably available as an ASCII symbol. So ASCII had a wide variety of available, uh, essentially symbols that you could choose from, which allowed for this game to be extensive in terms of what was available. So you didn't necessarily have to worry about picking like 10 enemies that all use the same letter of the alphabet. They could use a variety of different symbols that were available in the ASCII code. So that was a pretty neat idea because not only did it keep the game small, but it also allowed for some variety there. Now the name itself, ZZT, was actually chosen for kind of a funny reason. A lot of shareware 
distribution methods such as bulletin board systems or catalogs or or discs and such that you would get with shareware titles on them were arranged alphanumeric. So numbers go first, letters come second, and A through Z. Z is the very bottom of the alphabet. So if you're looking for something at the bottom of the alphabet, it's going to be there. And ZZT was always at the bottom of the alphabet. All Tim had probably had to say to people was like, hey, if you want to find ZZT, just look at the bottom of the alphabet. There it is. So I think that was kind of clever as a way to always let it stand out and never really get mixed up in the other game titles. However, there is a backronym to ZZT. And a backronym is kind of the opposite of an acronym. So the an acronym is an abbreviation of something that uses a series of letters that was created ahead of time. So like saying ATM is an acronym of automated teller machine. ZZT didn't have any meaning to the name until someone much later called it the Zoo of Zero Tolerance which Tim Sweeney actually endorsed, making that the now the kind of official, unofficial meaning of ZZT. Why they called it the Zoo of Zero Tolerance? Uh, no, I just remember seeing that, so... <laughs> The world may never know. ZZT is a fairly simple game. Uh, you play as a character that is represented by a... It's a, actually a smiley face that's on a little blue square. Yeah, yeah. A rectangle. It's a little blue rectangle and then a, a little smiley face on it. And it's like an... Ob, it's The smiley face is like stretched to fit the little blue rectangle. So it's a little like oblong. Yeah. And you can move the character around using cursor keys. You can also use your mouth. You have to... When you boot ZZT... It asks you if you're using a keyboard, a mouse, or a joystick, and you can select any of those options. So if you use a mouse, I think you can actually move the character around with the mouse. You can at least select things with the mouse. Keyboard, everything's keyboard driven, so you don't have to move the mouse or do anything with that. And joystick, you can use the joystick to move the character around. I think it assumed that you would at least have one button, because I think it was assuming that you had like an, a like some manner of joystick that was similar to like an Atari joystick, so mm, it would be like mm. a button or so there, um, so that I think that button could be bound as well. And then the second option would be whether you wanted to play the game in monochrome or with color, depending on the monitor that you have. Yeah. So you, if you had like a, a green screen, then you can play CCT in it, uh, assuming that you had the DOS software that could boot it. And now you could use other keys as well to uh, do other tasks. Most commonly, shoot. Uh, use you move your character around. You could shoot things. You have to actually, uh, depending on the version of ZZT you had, you had, you could uh, either you would push the button, the arrow key in which you want to shoot, and then you'd have to hold the shift key. Mm. So you'd point the arrow key up and shift, and you shoot up, right, left, so on and so forth. Uh, later versions would have spacebar to shoot. So it depended on what version of ZZT you got. So as we mentioned before, the game is very uh, customizable and it was deliberate that way. As almost like a text editor, it was easy for people to create content for the game and release it. Even children could m make their own ZZT game and put a world of ZZT together and, and put it out there to, into the world to be downloaded. And it was very easy to get a new world into your ZZT file. You would code a world, and I think you would, I think you could even save and export it in the ZZT game mm -hmm. itself yeah. to make the new world. It just like a game, those game editor was part of the, the game. You could create a new world, save it, and you get a file, and it would just be called your name dot world, and you could just put that on the internet, and someone could just take it and put it into their ZZD file, and it would show up. So it was really easy for you to just... And and it was shareware, right? So it was always shareware, which is just essentially a free product. Yeah, that yeah, right. It's just a free product that's distributed with a sometimes recommended registration. So certain game creators in ZZT would actually have a pop-up in the beginning of the game that would say, hey, you can play this game up to a certain point. If you want additional worlds of this game, you have to register. You have to mail me and list their personal address two dollars or eight dollars sometimes people have like an escalating offer where they would say you can mail me eight dollars and i'll put it on a disc for you but if you mail me the disc you can you only have to pay me six dollars and they'll i will mail you the rest of my game and which is just wild right you're i would love to see the numbers for how much money people spent on ZZT fan-made worlds versus the actual ZZT. <laughs> there was a lot of fan-made worlds to choose from, uh, probably upwards in the thousands. Tim Sweeney was dedicated to this customization. So he had a level design contest that he created for right after the release of the game for anyone who was registered with the game. And over 200 people submitted custom worlds into this contest. So there, and you could go to the Museum of ZZT 
It's just thousands upon thousands of thousands of custom worlds. Even, but even like there were groups that were that got together and they did custom worlds together and they produced them almost like a video game company would produce them. they were really they were they were a group of people that got together to make solely ZZT custom worlds and release them as video games and there were people who like drew art and did all this work in ZZT there were some games that even come off as just like art and we'll get into a, a few custom worlds that I personally remember and that's why we're gonna talk about them but there there's really thousands and thousands of custom worlds so as we mentioned the game was shareware <laughs> yeah which means that it is free it's be- so it was a very popular thing but it wasn't very popularly paid for <laughs> no <laughs> The sales figures and the numbers for the ZZT game platform, whatever you wish to call it, were kind of lackluster. And by 2009, after being released at 1991, so after, let's do some math here, 18 years, it's estimated only probably about four to 5,000 copies were officially registered and sold. Yeah, (laughs) which is not a lot. (laughs) I mean, that's... But there was a lot more of people playing this game. Yeah. It's kind of like WinRAR. You know, yeah, everyone yeah, uses yeah, yeah. it, but nobody pays for yeah. it. It's just kind of like WinRAR. And the reason I imagine is because you didn't need a registered copy of ZZT right. to play the other worlds. So you got this free game that gave yep. you access to like thousands of more free games. <laughs> There was no point right. to register it. No offense to Tim Sweeney, but there was no point to register ZZT. Right. And I mean, you may have even not registered ZZT, but you might register a copy. You of might have bought someone else's. ZZT. Yeah, exactly. That's like one of the, I'm just curious how many people sent money to Code Red that didn't send money to ZZT. Right. Yeah. I, I, I'm wondering about that as well. As Zach mentioned earlier on the show, the game was called ZZT for bulletin boards, and that's where it was primarily distributed yeah it was a, sh- a shareware game it was primarily distributed through a bulletin board system and it was also bundled with other shareware packages as well so if there was like a, a pile of shareware games that may be bundled in one zip drive or something like that you would download it and zzt would be there along with probably doom or, yeah right know, yeah, some yeah. other other shareware games that were coming out at the, that time uh, we should do an entire episode on shareware i games. would love to do an episode of shareware games sweeney eventually moved the Potomac computer systems from their headquarters, which was his parents' house, to a proper headquarters because they were successful enough to be able to have office space. Yeah. And Tim renamed the company and renamed it Epic Mega Games and later have rebranded just as Epic Games, which you may know them for Fortnite and Unreal. Yes. Oh, I wonder if there's a Fortnite ZZT. <laughs> After Sweeney left his parents' house, however, his father, Paul, continued to take care of his ZZT mail orders and continued to fulfill mail orders up until the final copy being sold in November of 2013. That's awesome. Like, imagine in 2013, Mr. Sweeney is just sitting there at home and then he gets a little, like, message that's like, someone registered a shareware copy of ZZT. And he's like, finally! (laughs) And he sent a letter to his son. He was like, no more. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's it. I'm all out. Last one. We... We registered all the copies. Uh, so you know what's funny is you could get you could get you could get ZZT on in in like a dot rar. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you could use WinRAR to open. You a, could open <laughs> one shareware with another sh- <laughs> one shareware. Shareware all the way shareware. down. So um, there are plenty of key worlds, as we would say, um, in, in ZZT, especially to Seth. I mean, Seth was the ZZT guy. But before we talk about some of those other key worlds, uh, let's talk about the kind of what I guess we can call the X of ZZT, uh, the letter X of ZZT. So when you got ZZT, when you downloaded ZZT, it came kind of pre-bundled with some worlds. There was the town of ZZT, city of ZZT, caves of ZZT, and the dungeons of ZZT. And these are worlds that um, were designed by T- Tim Sweeney back in 1991 with the original release. Which, 1991, Seth, well, that was 30 years ago. In fact, ZZT celebrated its 30th anniversary in January of this year. Wow, happy birthday, ZZT. Happy th- we're sorry we're yeah, late. Happy 30th birthday, <laughs> ZZT. Hope it's hope it was a good one. All of these feel very ZZT-esque in the sense that um, 
even today will hold up if someone's playing them. Um, and you can actually play these, all of these, through your browser if you go to the ZZT Museum, or the Museum of ZZT, as it's lovingly called. These games served as kind of the building blocks for all future ZZT projects, and without them, there wouldn't have been an injection of creativity into the platform. X of ZZT-type games were the action-adventure games where you would have to solve puzzles and collect items to unlock further items, though each one was quite extensive and pretty open-world when it comes to exploring. It ought also like to add that I think another useful thing that this town of ZZT, city of ZZT, etc. did was they really taught people what ZZT could do. So uh, like when you start town of ZZT, it has like a clearly labeled building that says like bank of ZZT and you go inside and it shows you what currency will look like in this world. So you can kind of determine how that you're going to create your game by looking at what's available to you as a resource and going from there. So obviously you could kind of customize a bit in terms of what characters represent what in your version of ZZT, but this at least gave you a jumping off point, right? So it showed you, oh, so-and-so uses this symbol for currency. Well, maybe I'll use that symbol as well sort of deal. Yeah, and actually on the splash screen itself for Town of ZZT, which was the first game world that was created for ZZT, in Town of ZZT, it starts off with, it's essentially four boxes next to each other and they're multicolored boxes. And inside each box, is a different uh, creature where it's a like a centipede, a lion, tigers, and others is what it's labeled as. And like Zach says, they use different symbols in each one. And Tim tries to choose, a, I guess, a, a good symbol for each one. Like the centipedes are zeros. Yeah, yeah. So it's like makes sense. And then underneath that is another box that says an Epic Mega Games production. And it's just a key to items in the world. So we'll say this symbol is for ammunition. This is for a torch. This is for gem. And one of the interesting one is this is for, it'll be like a symbol for passage. And it's an equal sign on a, a, a rectangle. And that equal sign on a rectangle is like the universal symbol for ZZT for like a scene shift. Mm, yeah. So when your character will go through it, there's usually a corresponding noise because this game had audio as well, not scripted voice. No. But it had like, like MIDI but there was like this weird noise that always played when you would enter or leave an area and uh it was it was cool that it would also play in other people's games and it kind of drew this interconnectivity between ZZT games where it was like the the ZZT MCU essentially or the ZZT CU I guess the ZZT cinematic universe where everything was kind of connected but a different story one of one of my now there's two custom uh, worlds that I want to talk to. I'll talk about one. Zach will talk about the other one. And the one that I want to talk about is a game called Burger Joint. Now, Burger Joint is, I believe, the inspiration for my love of adventure games. And it was uh, developed by a guy by the name of Matt Dabrowski. And it takes place in one restaurant. So it just takes place in this burger restaurant, as the name Burger Joint implies. And it doesn't leave that restaurant. So you always are in that restaurant the entire time the scene essentially is that restaurant and i believe um there is a scene there is like that equal sign to go somewhere else but all it does is progress the story like it may change like it may have days pass and you can go through it there's actually in in burger joint there's a, a little area that your character can sit and they'll do cinematics and when the cinematic is done the thing that is blocking your character from going to the next scene gets removed and you can go forward through the scene to continue on the game I thought it was kind of a unique way where your character kind of watches cinematics play out in ZZT. So it, it takes place in this uh, this burger restaurant and the the game does flow real time. So you may have an objective that you need to accomplish and you need to accomplish it like quickly because the game doesn't wait for you. The game will actually fail if you don't do anything or if you don't complete your like if you don't do everything that you need to do in order to accomplish the objective within the allotted time. And Matt Dabrowski, who also goes by Mad Guy as his ZZT creator name, he, he created Burger Joint back in 1998 and stated that the game was really heavily inspired by the game The Last Express, which is an old adventure game that takes place entirely on a train. So that permanent set, like always being on the train or always being in a burger joint, lends, I think, credence to the setting and almost makes the setting a character in its own right. Burger Joint also 
is heavily praised as probably one of the best ZZT games by custom ZZT games out there. It's a full flesh story and is just, it's good. It's a good story. It's worth playing. If, if you need a game to play in your browser while you're at work, Burger Joint is a great game to play in your browser at the ZZT Museum because you can do it and it's free and it's all, it's just, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a peach of a, of a game. I really enjoyed it. I encountered it at such a young age that I probably didn't even acknowledge that it was an adventure game or like what a genre of games was. I just was, I watched it and I was like, this, I like this. Like, this is cool. I like how this is the story. I wanted to know all about this burger restaurant and explore it and like try to find out everything about it. And uh, it was, it was fun and I enjoyed it a lot. And it's an interesting, it's an interesting story for sure. Um, I think it involves burglars at one point in time. I'm not, I, it's been a while since I've played it. Uh, so one of the next worlds that was really popular is called Code Red. Now, Code Red was created by Alexis Jansen and released in 1994. It's an adventure game where you play as a 16-year-old named Kyle Lipschitz, and you wake up one morning, turn on the TV, and the government is planning to fill Southern California with toxic waste. So you got to find out why. <laughs> And, and figure that out and stop it. Uh, there's some uh, really unique puzzles in, in Code Red where the puzzles are based on the story. They're not just kind of like random puzzles. Um, where Which which ZZT games had a lot of random yeah, puzzles. Yeah, whereas like a puzzle might have nothing to do with the game you're playing. <laughs> this one is actually as relevant to the story. And apparently there's a grand finale in space in eight different endings which is awesome now code red is actually one of those unique games where at the time you the version of code red that was available was also a shareware title technically so it was like you're playing a shareware zzt right and you download a shareware code red to be played on your shareware zzt but you could have sent a letter to alexis jansen with money for her to send you the disc with the complete version of code red which i think is a unique way to get your get your fan game out there i'm really curious how how many official copies of Code Red were sold? We could tweet at Alexis. We can. Um, so fun fact, uh, Alexis actually currently works for Wizards of the Coast and is heavily involved in Magic the Gathering and was actually, uh, I think, a key person in in at least some Magic the Gathering um, elements. I know nothing about Magic the Gathering, so I'm not going to try to make anything up about my knowledge of Magic, Magic the Gathering. I, I do know that she was is heavily involved in it and is still heavily involved in it. And she also released a number of other ZZT games during this time. So yeah, so um, that's so yeah, that's really ZZT. Some of the worlds that are available for ZZT. Obviously, not all of them. There are thousands, and there's also like probably a ZZT for the topic that you can think of. So you want Star Wars? They got Star Wars ZZT. You want Sonic? They got Sonic ZZT. Mario? Mario ZZT. You want some like role playing ZZT? They got role playing ZZT. Shoot 'em up ZZT? It's out there. There's ZZT everything. There's probably a Doom ZZT. It's just not like a first person. So ZZT, in regards to its legacy, is probably more fondly remembered from the wide variety of the third party creations, most likely more so than the actual game. <laughs> there was a sequel. It was officially released by Sweeney and a programmer named Alan Pilgrim called Super ZZT. It added more levels, features, and an overall larger world. Over the years, there's also been third-party editors, such as Kev Edit for Windows or Dream ZZT, which allows you to play ZZT on your Sega Dreamcast. <laughs> Why do you want to do this? Why not? <laughs> I mean, it's available. Before we go on, not only is there a Doom ZZT that was released back in 1995, there is also a Temple of Doom ZZT, which where one is based on the video game Doom, the other is based on the Indiana Jones movie, The Temple of Doom. Get you a game that can do both. I think that's what they say, right? So Sweeney did report that he had lost ZZT's original source code, uh, mostly due to a computer crashing. However, uh, fans of the game have actually worked on reconstructing constructing the source code with permission from Sweeney and I think as of like 2020 they got it down to be like 99% accurate to the original source code to the point you could like run the source code and get it to generate the exact same file that would have generated when he was originally compiling ZZT back in the day. In terms of a bigger legacy as mentioned Tim Sweeney would later create the Unreal Engine which I think probably made him a little more money than ZZT did. Maybe one or two more dollars. Maybe just a few more dollars. And and, and also his company, Epic Games, would later become a kind of mega force in, in game development and releasing of games. Right now, they're best known for their 
publication of Fortnite, which happens to be kind of the big thing that most people are really into, even though it's not probably as popular as it was maybe three years ago. Um, it's still pretty popular. So that's ZZT. That is uh, ZZT. ZZT. That's you'd say it if you're that's French. ZZT. There, there's so many ZZT. There's Sonic the Hedgehog ZZT Blast. Yeah, that's the one I think I remember. Um, So I was playing that one and they don't have sound effects for the ring. Instead, when you collect a ring, a little message pops up and it goes, Bing! <laughs> like p-i-n-g ping uh to represent the ring being collected so let's get into our byway pass before we um go down a deep rabbit hole of zzt seth <laughs> i think i started with uh my recently played so uh why don't you start it with your byway pass uh sure so the game that i'm excited to buy weight or pass on is a game called strange land which is uh, being developed by a studio called Wormwood Studios and is being published by Wajidai Games. Uh, and it takes place where you wake up in a surreal, surreal, you where you wake up in a surreal carnival where there's a woman who cries out to you before she leaps to her death. You don't know why or who she was or why she did that or who are you. And there is answers out there, but you have to discover them through the lands of strange lands and uh there's various puzzles and dark things lurking at the park's peak it's being put together by the same people who put together primordia where um i played a little bit of primordia it takes place in like dystopia future and you're like uh like filled with malfunctioning robots and stuff it's pretty fun it's it, they're both strange lands and primordia are point and click adventure games and so there is going to be a lot of story, some cool art, and that's it, right? It's a story and cool art. Like, that's pretty much an adventure game. So I do like Wadget Eye and what they publish, and I did like Primordia for the time that I played it. I will be putting Strange Lands down as a wait until I, I, I should probably go back and beat Primordia before I play another new game by them. So I'll put it down as a wait. Uh, it's going to be released quarter one of 2021, so probably sometime soon since we're midway through the quarter by the time of this episode's recording and release. More halfway there so yeah so we'll put it down as a wait well what about you so my by weight pass is going to be legend of zelda skyward sword hd skyward sword hd was announced as part of the february 17th nintendo direct it's an hd remake of the 2011 game that was released for the wii of the same name skyward sword one of the reasons i am kind of interested in this is because they specifically said that this version would have support for switch Lite, which i own so that's nice the reason i was worried it wouldn't have support for switch Lite is because skyward sword was really optimized to play on the wii meaning it has motion control that the switch Lite doesn't do very well because you don't have separate joy cons so it's kind of hard to do motion control on a system like the switch Lite. anyway they actually talked about in the nintendo direct how they have a they're releasing it with support for switch Lite. specifically there's going to be a controller setting you can toggle if you have a switch Lite or you're playing it in portable mode um your, your standard switch then uh they have some edits to the controls that allow you to play it that way as opposed to using the joy cons which is nice um i own a switch Lite, as i mentioned so um that makes me happy i like when games are supported for the switch Lite, obviously now i've never played skyward sword uh i don't own a wii though i wouldn't mind picking up skyward sword just to give it a shot i i do like the zelda games and i don't like feel like i have to play all of them but it would be nice to play ones that i've never played i am going to say that i'm going to wait on this title though uh, nintendo does have a tendency to sell games even remakes of old games at full price meaning this game will likely retail for 59.99 which is a lot of money to pay for an older zelda game. yeah that i might not even like <laughs> so i do want to wait until it will eventually go on sale most likely or if i can buy a used copy it is due out on july 16th though so i'll keep an eye out for it um, i believe pre-orders are launching tomorrow or later tonight which is it's actually the 17th as we record this so the nintendo direct just aired <laughs> so yeah um I'll, I'll, I'll put it down as a wait i'll keep my eye out for it and also see how reviews favorite yeah and that um that was the game where you, you swipe with the wii and do the yep, sword yep, motions yep, right exactly there. and then you fly up to the clouds yep, and stuff yep, like yep. that i had a friend who really liked skyward sword i played it very little bit well that's gonna be it for the episode uh so we're gonna do the thing where we tell you to do our thing so let's talk about the different ways that you can listen to us contact us and support us if you're listening to this portion of the podcast congratulations you figured out how to listen to us 
So you can get a round of applause and continue to listen to us. Or uh, you can find us on other listening apps. We're, we're on most listening apps that you can listen to us. Uh, Stitcher, Apple, Google, you, you name it, we're probably there. You can, if you also want a different listening experience, you can head over to our website. Our website is ClassicGamingBrothers.com. On our website, you, there is the Classic Gaming Brothers Lounge, where you can sit and relax and listen to our uh, the episode in our media player. There's also a contact button that you can click, and that'll bring you to our contact form, where you can send us some fan mail, which we love. We really appreciate appreciate fan mail anytime that you guys send it to us we love we read it all we respond to it all we love it and you can send it through us through the website through there or you can also just if you have your own email client which hopefully you do it is 2021 and email's been around for a bit uh you could send an email to classicgamingbrothers at gmail.com you can also send it to seth at classicgamingbrothers.com or zach at classicgamingbrothers.com or classicgamingbrothers at classicgamingbrothers.com any of those work they all go to the same email box we'll read and respond and we just really love the feedback if you guys have you can have feedback about the episode specifically about things that you like about things that you hate about things that you would hear want to hear more about uh we've done multiple episodes because of listener submission if you've listened to this podcast enough you you probably know that there is not a real good theme as it were like we don't have a a method to our madness or maybe we do we just haven't shared that with you but we generally do content as it comes Uh, we do have ideas in the pipeline and so we do have content planned out but if you have an idea uh we we can work on it as soon as we can Uh, so (laughs) What's that? Look at that. You send us a great idea, we'll read it and we'll we'll try to do something for you if we're comfortable with it. If you send us an idea and it's something that we're not necessarily comfortable with it, then we we may have to say no. But I mean, we're we're pretty comfortable fellows, so it it would just be if there's something that we can't speak if if we can't be pedantic about it, I don't know if it's going to be something that we we want to we would be able to do finally to support us listening to us is a great way to support us you can like us and subscribe to us and rate us on whatever podcast application that you're on those always help to support us and drive the whatever algorithms so that more people can listen to us because the objective is to get more people to listen to us so that more people can enjoy classic gaming brothers you can also mention us to a few of your friends perhaps even three to say hey i listen to a cool podcast it's called the classic gaming brothers you could check them out and you can send it over to them as well and finally you can support us by following and liking and subscribing to wherever we are on social media so we have a facebook we have an instagram we have a twitch we're at classic gaming brothers on facebook and instagram we're at cg brothers pod on twitter and we are twitch.tv slash classic gaming brothers so that's how you can listen to us contact us and support us zach is there anything else that i'm missing oh yeah There's one thing. Don't play games like my brother. And don't play games like my brother. I've been Zach. And I've been Seth. And we've been the Classic Gaming Brothers. That's That's right. right. Some fun ZZT items that I found were there are two Y2K themed ZZTs that were both released in December of 1999. There's a Warcraft ZZT. There's a Star Wars ZZT. There's a Star Wars ZZT specifically titled Star Wars Episode 7. It came out in December of 2000. So I don't know if they've got it right. (laughs) But Um, we can check. Um, There's also multiple X-Men ZZT. Some of them aren't made by the same person, but they were titled appropriately. So like the first X-Men game is made by an X-Men 2 is made by someone else.